Our call to worship this Lord's Day is taken from Psalm 91, verses 1 through 2. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will save the Lord. He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In him will I trust. Let us stand together in prayer. <clears> the <throat> Lord our God, thou art our mighty fortress. Thou art our buckler. Thou art our shield and our defense. And we come to thee this day through the sacrifice and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We approach thee this day because Jesus Christ is risen from the dead and every Lord's Day we do remember and celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank thee our God that as we approach thee that thou hast called us unto thyself we do not come without invitation. We come O Lord to offer our love, our praise, our thanksgiving Forgive us of our sins and cleanse us this day from all of our iniquities as we approach thee. We pray, receive now our worship through the mediation of the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let us take our Psalters and turn to Psalm 41. And we'll be singing verses 1 through 4. In the first four verses, the psalmist describes the blessedness of those who consider the, the plight and the needs of the poor and who reach out to them, who not only pray for them, but as they have opportunity to reach out to those who are needy. And we'll be singing to the tune of Kilmarnock, Dun 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 dun. Blessed is he that wisely doth. Blessed is he that wisely doth. The poor man's case consider. The poor man's case consider. For when the time of trouble is, for when the time of trouble is, the Lord will him deliver. The Lord will him deliver. God will him keep, yea, save alive. God will him keep ye safe alive. On earth he blessed shall live. On earth he blessed shall live. And to his enemies desire. And to his enemies desire. Thou wilt him not upgive. Thou wilt him not upgive. God will give strength when he on bed. God will give strength when he on bed. Of languishing doth mourn. Of languishing doth mourn, and in his sickness sore, O Lord, and in his sickness sore, O Lord, thou all his bed will turn, thou all his bed will turn. I said, O Lord, do thou extend. I said, O Lord, do thou extend thy mercy unto me. 
Thy mercy unto me. Oh, do thou heal my soul. For why? Oh, do thou heal my soul. For why? I have offended thee. I have offended thee. Let us continue our worship this Lord's Day as we have in this dialogue of worship expressed our praise to the Lord. So now he speaks to us through his word by spirit. Our Old Testament scripture reading this Lord's Day is taken from Ezekiel chapter 1. A highly prophetic book of the Bible. And in this opening chapter, Ezekiel receives revelation from God, which again has very highly figurative images uh, within it. There's in the first chapter uh, these images of four living creatures, which are angels whom God has appointed over his providence the four corners of the earth, four angels that oversee God's providence, God's workings within the earth. But it also speaks of uh, four wheels beside each of the four living creatures, which turn whichever way that the angels appoint that they should turn, which who are appointed by God according to his providence. And so the wheels represent that God's providence moves this direction, that direction, moves all over the earth. And the angels of God are his ministers to direct his providence. And then we find a throne with a man seated on the throne with a rainbow over the throne, which speaks of the rule, the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, sitting upon his majestic throne and the rainbow, speaking of the promises of God, the covenant of grace. In fact, uh, the, these particular uh, images that we find here in Ezekiel 1 are also uh, very, very much like what we find in Revelation chapter 4. And uh, the same basic interpretation of these images as well. And so as we go through Ezekiel, I will attempt to give a very, very brief uh, explanation of the chapter, perhaps if there are unfamiliar symbols uh, that are used just to, to clarify somewhat as we do read through uh, each Lord's Day uh, from our Old Testament scripture in this prophetic book of Ezekiel. <clears throat> now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river of Kibar, that the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. In the fifth day of the month, which was the fifth year of King Jehoiada, Ken's captivity, the word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel, the priest, the son of Buzai, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Kibar. And the hand of the Lord was there upon him. And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof, as the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire, also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man, and everyone had four faces, and every one had four wings, and their feet were straight feet, 
and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot, and they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. And they had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides, and they four had their faces and their wings. Their wings were joined one to another. They when they went. They went everyone straight forward. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man and the face of a lion on the right side. And they four had the face of an ox on the left side. They four also had the face of an eagle. Thus were their faces. And their wings were stretched upward. Two wings of every one were joined one to another, and two covered their bodies. And they went every one straight forward. Whither the spirit was to go, they went. And they turned not when they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, and like the appearance of lamps. It went up and down among the living creatures, and the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. And the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. Now as I beheld the living creatures, behold one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures with his four faces, the appearance of the wheels and their work was like unto the color of burl. And they had one likeness, and their appearance and their work was as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. When they went, they went upon their four sides, and they turned not when they went. As for their rings, they were so high that they were dreadful and their rings were full of eyes round about them four. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. Whithersoever the spirit was to go, they went. Thither was their spirit to go, and the wheels were lifted up over against them. For the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. When those went, these went, and when those stood, these stood. And when those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up over against them. For the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. And the likeness of the firmament upon the heads of the living creatures, the creature was as the color of the terrible crystal stretch forth over their heads above and under the firmament were their wings straight the one toward the other every one had two which covered on this side and every one had two which covered on that side their bodies and when they went i heard the noise of their wings like the noise of great waters as the voice of the almighty the voice of speech as the noise of an host. When they stood, they let down their wings. And there was a voice from the firmament that was over their heads when they stood and had let down their wings. And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. And I saw as the color of amber, as the appearance of fire round about within it, from the appearance of his loins even upward, and from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about. As the appearance of the bow, that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. 
And when I saw it, I fell upon my face, and I heard a voice of one that spake. We see the reaction of Ezekiel as he stood in the presence of the Lord. He fell down before the Lord. May this be in our hearts, likewise, our attitude as we approach the Lord today, that our hearts are humble before him as we worship the Lord, as we call upon him who sits upon the throne. Let us stand together in prayer. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we come unto thee this day to worship thee, to bring unto thee our praise and thanksgiving. Lord, to bring as well before thee our petitions and supplications for needs. Lord, what a joy and delight it is to gather as thy people on this Lord's day to bring unto thee worship that thou hast appointed, not worship which we designed ourselves, but which is, has been appointed in thine own holy word. And we gather, O Lord, this day, coming before thee, praising thee that we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we are not our own, for we have been bought with a price, May we then, O oh God, glorify thee in both our body and our spirit. We plead with thee, our Lord, that as we approach thee, that thou would look upon us, and may we cling to thy promise, the promise of the Lord Jesus Christ, that if we confess our sins, thou art faithful and just, to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And therefore, O oh Lord, as we come before thee, we come, O oh Lord, fearing thee with a holy boldness, not in, not in cowardice, but, O oh God, humbly we come. But we come boldly because thou hast opened the door and granted to us access into thy presence as thine own dear children. And thou, our God, has called us unto thyself and unto this throne of grace. And so, Father, we come boldly, confidently, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, into thy presence today. We ask our Lord and our God that thou would have mercy upon us and forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of our own self-sufficiency. Forgive us, O oh God, that we have not had a God-sufficiency, but rested, O oh Lord, rather in our, in our money, rested and trusted, O oh Lord, in the economy, looked to as our security blanket, our our paycheck, our checkbook, our employer, the stock market, the economy. Oh Lord, none of these are that in which we are called to trust. Our trust is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Forgive us, our God, wherein we have looked away from thee into these other things, which indeed are means that thou dost use to supply our needs, but they are not the supplier of our needs. Thou art the provider and supplier of all of our needs, even according to thy riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Our Lord and our God, forgive us for we have fallen into the sin of loving our money 
and what money can buy more than we love the Lord Jesus Christ. The things of this world, oh God, have become our first love rather than Christ being our first love. Have mercy upon us and deliver us, we pray. Our Father, we pray that thou would forgive us for our discontentment with our lot in life, becoming angry over our lot in life, becoming bitter toward thee and toward others because others have and we do not have what they have. Oh, Father, we pray, forgive us of such covetousness, which is idolatry according to thy word. Forgive us of jealousy. Have mercy upon us, our Lord and our God, for we have not searched our hearts and pled for thee to search our hearts and to try our thoughts and to see if there be any wicked way in us. But, O oh Lord our God, rather we have gone about excusing our sins, rationalizing our sins, procrastinating and doing what we know we ought to do. Father, have mercy upon us and forgive us as well. For we have compromised the truth, we have compromised thy righteousness in order to have friends and, and family close and near unto us. We have been willing to give up that, O oh Lord our God, which is most important, that is our love for thee, in order to have the things of this world. We have been willing, O oh God, to compromise thy commandments in order that we might have the things of this world. We pray, Father, forgive us and cleanse us of these sins. And Father, we likewise have not treasured Christ. We have not treasured the preached word. We have not treasured the ordinances that we have the privilege of receiving. We have not treasured the church of Jesus Christ as we ought. But rather, Lord, we have determined and we can see where our, true, where our treasure has been. For thy word says, where our treasure is, there will our heart be also. And so often, O oh Lord, our treasure has been in this world and the things of this world rather than in the gospel and in the ministry of thy word in the ordinances and sacraments that thou has blessed us with we pray father that thou would forgive us of these and the sins we have committed against one another our highly critical attitude are not bearing the burdens of one another, are not upholding one another in prayer and the needs, not reaching out when we know there are needs in our midst or those, Lord, who uh, that we know have needs. Lord, we have put our hands in our pockets and left them there. We have grown coal in our prayers, our God. We have not been warriors, as it were, in prayer. But, Lord, we have been estranged from thee. For, God, we have not enjoyed communion and fellowship with thee. And our love for others, therefore, has also grown cold. We ask our Father that thou would forgive us of these and many others, O oh Lord, that we have committed against thee as we approach thee today and as we worship thee. Father, we... Offer to thee, Lord, our, our own lives as living sacrifices, praying that thou would use us for thy glory. Use us in our family. Bless our family, our God. For, Father, we pray that we would not be uh, used of the enemy to persecute our family members, to drive our family members from us as well as from thee by the way we treat them. But, O oh God, may we in our homes 
become like uh, uh, magnets drawing our family members unto us as we, like magnets, are drawn into the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, Father, we pray that thou would uh, hear our prayers for those women who are with child. Bless, Lord, the fruit of the womb. Be with both mother and child and bring these little ones forth without complication, we pray. We ask our Lord that, that thou would be with thy church, that thou would heal her of her many divisions and schisms. Our God, we plead with thee. And we look to thee for father uh, from the perspective of mere human beings it looks hopeless and it is hopeless if we were merely to depend upon our strength and our resources but lord uh, it is not impossible it is not hopeless thou wilt bring about a blessed covenant of uniformity and doctrine and worship government and, and discipline and Lord, we, we pray, we work toward where we have, Lord God, stood in the way of that by way of our own backsliding, by way of our own lack of love, our own lack of prayers for thy church. Have mercy upon us and forgive us. We pray, remove, Lord, uh, the corrupt doctrine, remove impure worship, tyrannical church government and discipline from thy church. Raise up faithful church officers, we pray, O oh Lord, that might go forward and lead thy church, who would care for thy flock, who would not be hirelings who run when times get tough and difficult, but who lead thy flock in the paths of righteousness and truth. O oh Lord, we pray that thou would have mercy upon the nations of this world. We pray, Father, that thou would cause the nations to see how they have joined hands, Lord, with the enemy to rebel against the Lord and his Christ, against the Lord Jesus Christ, who is King of kings and Lord of lords, by the many laws that they have enacted, by the many wickednesses that are tolerated by the divine institutions, O oh Lord, that are that are uh, corrupted and and despised, and Lord sought uh, destruction of. We pray, Father, that Thou would bring remorse, that Thou would bring true repentance, that Thou would humble the nations. Our God, cause the gospel of Jesus Christ to go forth in such a way as to uh, be blessed by thy spirit and to draw the nations of this world and thine ancient people Israel unto thyself. We plead with thee, our God, that thou would intervene in the decision of the Supreme Court of this nation, which is due to render a decision with regard to the divine institution of marriage. They cannot alter that divine institution, but they certainly can seek to pervert it by way of uh, promoting some type of so-called right for those of the same sex and gender to supposedly engage themselves in marriage. O oh Lord, it is an abomination in thy sight Lord, we pray that thou would lead these justices away from such a perversion. We pray, our God, that thou would uphold, even in, even in such a decision, that divine institution. We plead with thee, our God, that thou would destroy all false religion that stands against the gospel of Jesus Christ against biblical Christianity, against the Lord Jesus Christ as he extends his kingdom. We pray, our God, that thou would bring down, O Lord, uh, those who hate thee and despise thee. O Lord, those who uh, offer counterfeit religions as ways 
to approach thee, but, O oh God, thy word teaches there is really and only one way. For Jesus said, He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by him. And so, Lord, we pray that thou would put down, Lord, Buddhism and Islam, that thou would put down our God cults, that thou would put down, O oh Lord, <clears throat> Uh, the Roman Catholic Church, uh, we plead with thee, our Lord, that thou would sanctify, Lord, thy people, and that, that we would put away all of our false worship and false doctrines. We plead with thee, our God, today, that thou would be with those who are suffering uh, chronic illness, chronic, chronic pain, our God, Lord, that thou would grant to them healing, grant to them the grace to, uh, uh, to endure that which, Lord, they suffer. May, the, Lord, they turn to thee, and may they look upon their suffering as suffering for the cause of Christ because they turn the suffering over to thee. We plead with thee, our Lord and our God, be with those who are faithful witnesses of Jesus Christ throughout the world, who are standing for thy truth and righteousness, and who have been imprisoned, who have been cut off from their families, who are being tortured, who have even, Lord, suffered death for the cause of Jesus Christ. May their witness, Lord, bear much fruit. We pray, our God, be with their families, uphold and strengthen their families, uh, during such times and may we Lord God look on may we realize that we may not be long ourselves to undergo similar types of persecution for the cause of Jesus Christ may we not be those who throw up our arms and run and surrender all in order to have that type of comfort and security, but may we be willing even to lay down our lives for the Lord Jesus Christ and his truth and righteousness. We pray, our Father, that thou would be with those to whom we have shared the gospel. Cause, Lord, the gospel to bear fruit in the lives of family members and friends, neighbors, even strangers that we have uh, testified to of the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless now thy word as it goes forth, Lord, uh, unless thou dost add thy blessing, unless the Spirit attends to the preaching of the word, unless thy power goes forth, Lord, it will not bear fruit in our lives. It will be as words that fall from the mouth and to the floor. And so, Father, cause thy word not to return void. Bless it and use it in the lives of thy people and draw, Lord, sinners unto thyself to confess their sins and to turn to Jesus Christ even today. We ask our God that thou would hear our prayers, for we do offer them through the death and the resurrection of him who sits at thy right hand, who is King of kings and Lord of lords and who is our mediator even the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our New Testament scripture reading this Lord's Day is taken from 1 Timothy chapter 5. In this uh, portion of the epistle to Timothy from the Apostle Paul, uh, as he is giving directions concerning the establishment of the church in Ephesus, in chapter 5 he comes to the need to have uh, those who are uh, here called widows, and widows uh, indeed. This was a class of elderly women that went forth 
and were sent forth by the church to minister to the various needs that people in the congregation had. And uh, so these were very, very important uh, minist a ministry that the Lord established. And so he speaks concerning that, but then he closes the chapter in speaking about the office of elder and uh, just instruction concerning uh, elders as well. Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren, the elder women as mothers, the younger as sisters with all purity. Honor widows that are widows indeed, but if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and to requite their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. Now she that is a widow indeed and desolate trusteth in God and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. And these things give in charge that they may be blameless. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Let not a widow be taken into the number under three score years old, having been the wife of one man, well reported of for good works. If she have brought up children, if she have lodged strangers, if she have washed the saints' feet, if she have re uh, relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. But the younger widows refuse, for when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. And withal, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. For some are already turned aside after Satan. If any man or woman that believeth have widows, let them relieve them, and let not the church be charged, that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Them that sin, rebuke before all, that others also may fear. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels, that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality, Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. Some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment, and some men they follow after. 
Likewise also the good works of some are manifest beforehand, and they that are otherwise cannot be hid. May the Lord bless both the reading and the preaching of his holy word this Lord's Day to the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. We continue in our series through the fruit of the Spirit and focusing once again upon the fruit of temperance or self-control. And so let us consider once again Galatians 5, 22 through 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. And then I would have you consider with me 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all evil. If I only had more money, I would be happy in this life. Perhaps we've all considered at one time or another how having more money would make us happier than we presently are. What would it feel like to have no debts? What would it feel like to, to have our house paid off completely? There's nothing, dear ones, wrong with seeking to pay off debts, so we should do. But if we believe that what is finally going to make us content in this life, what is going to bring joy and peace in this life is having more money, we are sadly mistaken. For many people, there's not a, a higher goal in life than to gain money and what money can buy. Even as Christians, we can be led by the tempter to crave money, to think about it throughout the day, and to covet it as if money will solve all of our problems and then usher in contentment. Beloved, this is the seduction of money. It promises everything that it cannot deliver on its promises. Dear ones, we often point our fingers at the rich as if it is only the rich who struggle with coveting money. But we who do not have the wealth that others have know very well within our own hearts that we desire, that we crave, that we covet money at various times in our life. We're all prone to this particular sin of loving money. It's not simply the sin of millionaires and billionaires. It is we. We who are sitting here, we who are listening or watching the sermon today, it is we who likewise struggle with the love of money as we face various financial difficulties in our lives. So therefore, we all need to be vigilant. We all need to be watchful against the temptation to think, that money will bring us happiness and joy, and that money will satisfy our deepest needs. The sin of the love of money, dear ones, is not limited to simply cash or coins, but is ultimately found in coveting and loving this world and the things that are within this world. 
which money can buy. You see, one cannot be characterized as a lover of money, as a lover of this world, and yet have the love of the Father dwelling in him or her, according to the Apostle John in 1 John 2.15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. We fall into the temptation to love money, but we cannot be characterized by those who do love money and live for money. No doubt many may look at various heinous sins and place the love of money somewhere at the bottom of that list of heinous sins, which is why we so often, I believe, are so vulnerable to this particular sin and its temptation because we do place it at the very bottom of the heap. We do not take it seriously. We do not examine our lives with regard to, do I or am I loving money? Do I love money and what money can buy? Materialism, worldliness. It's usually not treated as seriously, dear ones, as other sins. It is more easily justified, it seems, in our lives or excused than other sins. But yet the Apostle Paul states that the love of money is the root of all kinds of, of sin and evil and leads people even to perdition, hell itself, the love of money. It was, in fact, there was the love of money that kept a certain wealthy ruler away from entering into the kingdom of God in Luke 18. Even though he claimed he had, to the best of his knowledge, sought to keep all of the commandments of God. Thus, as we consider this attack of the love of money that comes against us. The love of materialism and seeking to break down this wall of, of the fruit of self-control. Let us not undermine, let us not belittle this sin in the least. For whether we are rich or poor by earthly standards, we are all susceptible to this sin. We are all vulnerable to the formidable attacks of this enemy, which has the potential of destroying our lives. The main points for the sermon this Lord's Day are these. Number one, the love of money is always ready to breach the wall of self-control. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 through 10. And the second main point, the wall of self-control is fortified by godly contentment. The wall of self-control is fortified by godly contentment. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses six through eight. So let us consider our first main point then. The love of money is always ready to breach the wall of self-control. Consider with me 1 Timothy 6 verses 9 through 10. <clears throat> but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, 
they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Paul here writes to his spiritual son in the faith, Timothy, whom Paul had directed to establish this church in Ephesus that had been planted through the efforts and the ministry of the Apostle Paul and his co-labors. Paul's letter to Timothy was keenly directed to the needs that were present in a newly formed church, particularly addressing the problem of Jewish converts who sought to be teachers within the church, to be teachers of the law, but did not understand or teach the gospel of grace through Jesus Christ in all of its soundness and in all of its purity. As the Apostle Paul draws Timothy to consider the things that he is about to give to him in 1 Timothy chapter 6, he warns concerning these Jewish teachers, these false teachers that were perverting in various ways the truth and the gospel of Jesus Christ. He speaks to them in the words that we find in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness from such withdraw thyself. Carefully note the last description of these unfaithful teachers there in the church of Ephesus. Supposing that gain is godliness. In verse 5. In other words, these teachers act as though their large following, their financial support, which is here called their gain, were indications of, of their godliness. Isn't, they may have said, isn't the success and gain of my ministry an indication of my godliness? Paul says, no. It is not an indication of their godliness. In fact, he says, withdraw from them. Separate yourselves from them. But isn't that what many on TV and radio want us to believe is true even today? That their immense following, their large buildings, their amazing offerings, that come from in from all over the world are an indication of their godliness. From such men who focus upon their gain, whether numerically or financially, Paul says to us and to Timothy, withdraw thyself. Do not be their followers. It is shameful and it is revolting, dear ones, to the ears of the faithful to lis listen to such charlatans who are simply getting rich off of the use of Christ's holy name. The covetous nature 
of false teachers in Ephesus and today is very evident by the amount of time spent on talking about giving and giving and giving and giving while they grow richer and richer and richer and richer and add planes to their arsenal and have several mansions all over the, the world and yet they're drawing from the mites of widows. Nothing of this sort do we find in the Holy Scriptures is an abomination in the eyes of the Lord. Therefore, Paul says, withdraw thyself from them. You see, this is the thread. These false teachers that are just mentioned, who suppose that gain, financial gain, numerical gain, is godliness. That's the thread. That's the jumping off platform to Paul's discussion about money, which is more general in nature. He moves from these false teachers to talk about the love of money, and covetousness that can be present not only in the lives of such false teachers, but in our own lives. In 1 Timothy 6, 9, Paul begins with the word but, but they that will be rich. Indicating here, here is a contrast. That's how these false teachers have lived. And then he talks about, which we'll cover in a moment, contentment. But he's distinguishing this godly contentment that he's mentioned in the previous verses, sandwiched in between the false teachers and what he says about the love of money, sandwiched in between is a discussion about contentment. Now he says, having discussed or having gone through in this chapter, spoken about this godly contentment, he now contrasts that godly contentment with this that we read here, beginning with but in 1 Timothy 6, 9. <clears throat> Who among us, dear one, has not been tempted and fallen into this temptation? The love of money. It is indeed a formidable temptation when we must pay bills and seem as though we have to stretch every penny in order to do so. It is a formidable temptation when there are health issues that arise within our family. We don't have the money. We don't have the insurance in order to pay for their need. It is a formidable temptation when the rent or the mortgage payment must be paid. We're not sure where it's coming from. It's a formidable temptation when we look back over our lives and we see the foolish mistakes that we have made in, in buying and purchasing things that we did not need at all and have built up debt upon debt upon debt. Who among us at such times has not dreamed or wished or thought? If only I were wealthy, if only I had more money, these hardships would no longer stand in my way in hindering my joy, my peace, and my contentment. I could then pay all my bills and perhaps even have enough to be able to share with others who are in need, to give to the church, to the, the ministry of the church. We are, dear ones, in such a case, I submit to you, when that is the case, we are trusting in our riches or trusting in riches we do not have. We are trusting in riches in either case as being the answer and the panacea to all 
of our problems. We are trusting in such a case in the uncertainty. Paul calls this the uncertainty of riches in 1 Timothy 6, 17. Riches that are here today, gone tomorrow, rather than in trusting in the living God who never changes, who owns it all, who loves us with an everlasting love and has promised to meet our needs. Even according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. There was riches are never the answer. Christ is always the answer riches as it says in proverbs 23 5 take up wings and fly away you cannot depend upon riches and many have found that to be the case to their own destruction the tighter we seek to cling to money the more unhappy we become because we fear losing that to which we tightly cling. However, the, the, the tighter we cling to the Lord Jesus Christ and faith, the more joyful, peaceful, and content we become. And when we think and act as though money, dear ones, is the answer, we are warned with the strong words that are found in 1 Timothy 6, 9. But they that will be rich, and this is the warning, fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. But they that will be rich. This refers to a, a settled determination and goal and purpose in a person's life. Not to be faithful with what God gives to us, but to purpose, I want to. Above all, I want to be rich. That's my supreme goal, to be rich. But you ask, is it sinful or wrong to be rich? Well, no, it's not sinful and wrong to be rich. Job was wealthy and was, quote, the greatest man in the East, end of quote, in Job 1.3. Abraham became exceedingly wealthy and yet is called the friend of God in James 2.23. Certainly a number of the righteous and pious kings of Judah were very wealthy. Joseph of Arimathea who took Christ's body and buried it in his own tomb was said to, to be rich. In Matthew 27, verse 57, a faithful follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. There was, it is not sinful to be rich, either by inheritance or by hard work. It is not sinful to be successful in business in itself <clears throat> in fact it is by the hand of the lord that riches come to his people it is because the lord prospers them he is the one to be praised for such blessings for example in deuteronomy chapter 8 verses 17 through 18 we read and thou say in thine heart, here it is that the Lord is raising objections uh, that Israel may think that it is due to their 
their own resources, to their own power, that they have gained riches, that they have gained this land that God has given to them. And God answers such an objection. And thou say in thine heart, my power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth. It is God who gives the power to gain wealth. Likewise, we, we read in Ecclesiastes 5, 19. Every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth and hath given him power to eat thereof, and to take his portion, and to rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God. This is the gift of God. And then, at the end of this very chapter, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, God, who giveth us richly all things, to enjoy. Thus God, dear ones, God is not down upon the rich simply because they are rich any more than God is up with the poor simply because they are poor. It is all a matter of the heart in being poor in spirit and yet rich in the grace of Christ and in the fruit of the Holy Spirit. You see, dear ones, it is a question here of who is serving whom. Are you serving money? Or is money serving you as you serve the Lord? Who is the Lord and who is the master? Jesus says in Matthew 6, 24, no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Dear ones, the sin involved in money is not so much possessing it, but loving it and trusting in it to meet your needs. And that can be, as I said, the case, whether you are rich or whether you are poor. But you say, I don't want to be rich. I simply want more than I presently have. I just want enough to pay the bills and to live comfortably without the daily stress of financial problems in my life. Believe me, dear ones, when I say to you, I do understand. I do understand. I have been there. And I have done that and know very well the tension and the stress of living under that great burden. It's not easy. It is not easy. But I still say to you, money is not the answer to your problems. Money will not bring joy and contentment into your lives. There are far more important needs in your life and in mine than mere money, namely a godly contentment in Jesus Christ, which we will shortly consider. A godly contentment in Christ, dear ones, is far more valuable and of great and infinite gain than any earthly treasure upon the earth. With godly contentment in Christ, you may be a pauper. And yet the riches of heaven will reign in your heart and in your life. 
or with godly contentment, dear ones, you may be a billionaire. And yet the riches of this world you see is simply passing away. In light of the glories of the riches awaiting you in heaven. Paul then issues a, a very strongly worded caution to all those who would set wealth and riches as a settled and determined purpose in their life. In the remainder of verse 9, 1 Timothy 6, 9, they, he says, fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts. Notice, which drown men in destruction and perdition, hell itself. We are, dear ones by nature, so quick to think, oh, I can handle, if anyone can, I can handle money. I can handle the temptations that might come my way with regard to the love of money if i had money i would be able to handle it but so many so many have thought the same thing and have become swallowed up by the traps the enemy set for them when their hearts became enamored with making riches the pursuit and the goal of their life achan in joshua chapter 7 was an Israelite. He was forbidden, all, as all Israel was, from taking any of the riches, any of the wealth from the fallen city of Jericho. But he saw something by way of wealth that he wanted within the city of Jericho, a love of money. He took it. It cost him his life. Gehazi was a prophet. I mean, uh, was a servant of a prophet, servant of Elisha in 2 Kings chapter 5. Naaman, the Syrian captain, had come, be cleansed of leprosy, and he was cleansed and offered Elisha a reward, uh, at least uh, some token of his appreciation and thanksgiving. But Elisha turned it away would not receive it. And as Naaman was leaving, Gehazi ran quickly and caught him and said, by way of his de deceit and lying, my master's changed his mind and now he wants what you offered. And so he took it unto himself. It brought upon Gehazi as Elisha told him, what he had done by way of the, the knowledge of the Lord and brought leprosy upon him. Solomon, the wisest mere man that ever lived, should have known and should have been able to ward off the temptations of loving money. But even Solomon fell into the trap of loving money. Judas Iscariot was an apostle of Jesus Christ. And yet the love of money drove him to sell his Lord for 30 pieces of silver. Ananias and Sapphira were part of the early church. They heard the apostles of Jesus Christ speak those wondrous words. They witness the, the power of their miracles performed in the name of Jesus Christ. And yet they lied. They lied unto the Holy Spirit as they lied to Peter, saying they had given all when they would have withheld a portion for themselves. Certainly wouldn't have been wrong if they would have withheld a portion to themselves, but they lied in order to be seen by men that as if they had given it all unto the Lord, but their love of money drove them 
to this. Dear ones, beware when you think you stand, lest you fall into such a temptation. The road of history, dear ones, is lined and cluttered with millions of those who thought they could handle riches and wealth that fell under the seducing spell of loving it, loving what money can buy, trusting in money to meet their needs, and craving more and more of it. The more that they have gotten, the more they desired, the more they wanted. An insatiable appetite. The more you feed it, the more it wants. That is why we find this warning concerning riches in Proverbs 30, verse 9, wherein he prayed that God would not give him riches, not because riches were sinful, but notice, lest I be full and deny thee and say, who is the Lord? You see, dear ones, that is the dangerous spell that riches will cast upon those who are seduced by them. The Lord? Who's the Lord? I've got my riches. I don't need the Lord any longer. Why do I need the Lord? I drive all that I need from my riches. In 1 Timothy 6.10, Paul begins with the word for. For the love of money is the root of all evil. From, from what Paul has just said in verse 9, he now draws this concluding reason. For the love of money is the root of of all evil. Well, let us note the following about this concluding reason of Paul's. Paul does not say that money is the root of all evil, but rather the love of money is the root of all evil. As already indicated, money like wine or like adornment of the body is not evil in itself, but money like every other good gift from God may be abused and is abused so often to the destruction of one's body, to the destruction of one's family, the destruction of one's job, to the destruction of one's health, to the destruction of one's faith and to the destruction of one's soul. For we read right afterwards in verse 10, which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. It is when money and that which money can buy is our love. When money is that which we cherish, dear ones, above all. When money is the goal and the end for which we chiefly work. When money is that in which we trust or those who can give it to us here upon the earth or supply it to us here upon the earth. It is then that we fall into the sin of being a lover of money. Do you want to know whether the love of money is a sin into which you are falling? Well, let's begin with the words of the Lord Jesus as we seek to evaluate our own lives. Jesus says in Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. 
correspondingly where your treasure is not, there will your heart be not as well. In other words, show me what you spend your money on and I'll show you where truly your heart is. Now we're getting very personal, I know. Look at your budget. Go through your checkbook and look at your expenditures and you will soon see what you really have set your affections upon in this world. And as you begin to evaluate, you begin to see how much have I spent of what I have in ministering to others, in serving others. How much do I have that I spent in promoting the kingdom of Christ, in supporting the ministry of Jesus Christ, as opposed to how much have I spent on toys to simply bring my own pleasure, my own desires, or new fashions, or new pleasures, new comforts. Now, again, I want to be clear. It is not wrong to buy something that would bring us pleasure in and of itself. But when we begin to evaluate what, where our heart is, we can see where we have spent our money and where we have not spent our money. That is very telling in our own lives. We can't deny it. It's objective testimony. We know in our heart of hearts where we have spent our money. There, Jesus says, I didn't say it, Jesus said it. That's where your heart is. Where your treasure is. Beloved, the maturity of your spiritual life or the lack thereof can usually be sized up very well by what you do with your money. Where is your heart? What do you love? A money trail in our lives will usually be a good indication of where our treasure is and where our treasure is not. Do you want to know whether the love of money is a sin into which you are falling? Let me ask you some questions then, in addition to what I have already indicated, what Jesus has said. Are you spending money behind the back of your spouse for something you don't want him or her to know anything about? You see, the love of money and what money can buy is more important to you at that point than a good relationship with your husband or wife. Do you resent giving to the needs of others or to the ministry of Christ? Or do you make excuses for not doing so or as to why you cannot do so? Do you want others to know how much you make in order to flaunt that before others to impress others? Are you content with what God has already given to you? Can you find the contentment of the Lord Jesus Christ, a godly contentment in what you already have? Because if you cannot find contentment in what God has already given you, I guarantee you, you cannot find and will not find contentment if he gives you more. Because the issue is not how much you have. The issue is in whom are you trusting? Who is your first love? But let me, dear ones, make clear that you're giving to help others in need or to build the kingdom of Christ must proceed from a heart that desires that Christ, above all, be glorified. And that your giving is an expression 
of your faith and your love and your gratitude, your thankfulness to the Lord Jesus Christ and not a means of promoting your own self-righteousness before God or proudly before others. <clears throat> your motivation in giving to the needs of others, giving to the ministry of Christ church must always be as found in the words of Lord Jesus, freely ye have received, freely give. Matthew 10, 8. It's love of money in an absolute sense, the root of all evil. Actually, it is best, I believe, to interpret the word all here, not as all in an absolute, unrestricted sense, all without exception, but as all in a relative sense, all without distinction. In other words, Paul is saying the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, not the root of every evil. For it's clear from scripture that bitterness in our hearts is a root that leads to certain sins according to Hebrews 12 15 and that lust lust in uh, uh, the heart is a root that leads to other types of sins according to James 1 15 and we could say the same thing about pride about unbelief about fear as being a sin that leads to other sins. Think for a moment with me here. What will people not do for money? For the love of money, people have committed and will commit every conceivable sin. They will take bribes. They will lie. They will steal. They will cheat, they will rob, they will murder, they will prostitute their bodies. They will call evil good and good evil. They will compromise what they profess to believe. They will break God's commandments. And they, thinking of ministers, in particular, and they will preach that which tickles the ears of people rather than that which challenges them to walk the narrow path of Jesus Christ that leads to life. Not looking back over their shoulders like Lot's wife at what she was leaving behind, but looking forward to the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ and being willing to take upon himself or herself the yoke of Jesus Christ, to take up the cross of Christ, deny oneself and to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, preaching that message may dwindle out one's congregation, but not to do so is preaching for the love of money. Well, dear ones, this is the enemy that seeks to break through the wall of self-control, that fruit of the spirit of self-control. This is another enemy that seeks to break through that wall of self-control, the love of money. But the good news is found in our second main point, which I'll briefly share with you, is that the wall of self-control is fortified by the grace of godly contentment. <laughs> so our second main point, the wall of self-control is fortified by godly contentment. Look with me at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. But godliness with contentment is great gain. 
for we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we cannot it is certain we can carry nothing out and having food and raiment let us be therewith content <clears throat> The godliness with contentment is great gain. Godly contentment, dear ones, is a sufficiency. Not a sufficiency in self. Godly contentment is a sufficiency in Christ, in God who owns all. We find godly contentment when we do not have because our Heavenly Father owns it all. And dear ones, that godly contentment in an all-sufficient God begins with the truth that God owns everything. God owns everything. All that we have and all that we do not have, dear ones, is God's. This, this same word that's used for contentment in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6, and in verse uh, 8, is uh, translated as sufficiency in 2 Timothy. Corinthians 3 5 where the Apostle Paul says not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves but our sufficiency is of God same Greek word that's used with regard to contentment in 1st Timothy 6 so that is why I said earlier Godly contentment is sufficiency, but not a sufficiency in ourselves. Our sufficiency is not in ourselves. Our sufficiency is in an all-sufficient God. Likewise, in Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. The earth, the universe, is the Lord's. There's no lack of wealth on the part of God. No lack of riches on the part of God. You see, there was, if you do not begin there, you will never know contentment. For you will continually be arguing with God about what you believe is yours, what you believe you are entitled to in this world, or you will be trying to bargain with God about this or that. No, God owns it all. God is sovereign. God hands out the wealth and the riches as he pleases, but he has promised that he will supply all our needs as his own dear children according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You see, that is why Job was able to utter the words, because he believed it all belonged to God. That's why he was able to utter the words we find in Job 121, when he said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God had taken away all his wealth. God had even taken away his children. And yet he professes and confesses his faith in the living God who owns it all. Dear ones, it is easy in, in one sense to profess, yes, Lord, thou dost own it all, but it's a different thing to live it. May our faith not merely be in words, dear ones, but may our faith be lived out every single day do you profess dear ones the sovereignty the love the wisdom of god and yet deny it 
by your words and your deeds. Next, a godly contentment is grounded upon the truth that Christ has purchased everything in this life and in the life to come that you who trust alone in Christ alone need in order to live a godly life. Jesus has already purchased all that you need. God owns it all. And from what God owns, Jesus has purchased all that you need by way of an inheritance that he has ratified in his own blood for his people. All spiritual blessings have been purchased by Christ for you, according to Ephesians 1, 3. And all earthly blessings have likewise been purchased for you that you need in order to live a godly life. Once again, Philippians 4, 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. His inheritance, the inheritance that belongs to Jesus Christ, dear ones, is your inheritance. For you are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Next, the godly contentment is based upon the truth that Christ has legally won the battle over those very temptations that come your way, that lead you away from godly contentment and lead you into an ungodly discontentment. Jesus has already, dear ones, legally won the battle over all his and your enemies. That's the truth. He has won the battle. He has purchased a victory. He has conquered legally the enemy already. And that, dear ones, means you have hope of not succumbing to those temptations of the love of money. There is hope. Not hope in yourself, but hope in the sufficiency of Christ, in the victory through his death and his resurrection. There is hope of overcoming that temptation of the love of money and any other temptation that wars against you. There is hope in Jesus Christ because he has already won the victory. John 15, 5, without me, you can do nothing. Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Next, a godly contentment is enjoyed only when we seek. There was our contentment in Christ, in trusting Christ, in loving Christ, in hoping in Christ, in communing with Christ, and in obeying Christ. When we look away, when we look away from Christ, who loves us and knows us better and knows better what we need than we could ever know better what we need for ourselves. And we rather than looking to Christ, look at the prosperity of others. Look at our particular needs and focus our heart and our attention upon our needs. And then we look around at others and we say, they don't have the same problems that, that I do. And we covet then what they have or despise them for having it and feel sorry for ourselves and spend our lives loving and craving money more and more and more. We are setting ourselves, dear ones, upon a path of self-destruction that will lead to our misery rather than to our joy. Godly contentment is only enjoyed when Jesus Christ is our life and our very reason for living. As Paul says in Philippians 1.21, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. You see, with that 
as a rule of life for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. How can a Christian possibly lose? Regardless of what happens to me, for me to live is Christ. Even death is not a loss. It is a gain because I go to be with Jesus Christ. Everyone says it's not money that is of a great gain, but rather godliness with contentment that is of a great gain. And finally, a godly contentment will only be realized in our hearts when our hearts are filled with thanksgiving and praise to the Lord for all that he has purchased for us, freely given to us in Christ Jesus. Everything that we have of a spiritual as well as of a material nature is freely given to us. We did not deserve one speck of it. You see, when our hearts are filled with thanksgiving to God, they're not going to be filled with criticisms. They're not going to be, be filled with complaints. A heart that is content is always a heart, dear ones, that is searching for reasons. Not waiting for the reasons to just kind of knock them up alongside the head, but is searching for reasons to be thankful for the faithfulness and the mercies of the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Notice in 1 Timothy 6.7 that godly contentment knows and lives out the truth that all in the world is temporary. You came into this world naked, and you will leave this world naked. So why lose yourselves over that which is vanishing and will perish? That's essentially what Paul is saying when he says, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Why do we then allow the world all of the power over our lives that we do. It's vanishing. God help us to set our eye of faith and eye of hope upon that which is not vanishing and will not vanish. And then in 1 Timothy 6, 8, Paul says, And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. Paul says that godly contentment is not consumed with obtaining or consumed with uh, concerned with securing all of the extra comforts, toys, and, and luxuries of this life. It's not consumed with those things, but rather trusts in the Lord to meet the basic needs of life, food, clothing, shelter, and in that, Paul says, he will be content. And even when those are taken away, he says in Philippians 4, he knows even to go without some of those things, and it did not affect his contentment. So our contentment is not even in the necessities of life, but if God gives us the necessities of life, God help us to be content with the necessities of life. Can you be content and satisfied with those necessary things that God has given to you? If not, if not, your wall of self-control is ready to fall before the enemy, the love of money. There was a way to fortify in conclusion, the way to fortify the wall of self-control against the enemy of covetousness, greed, discontentment, complaining, 
and criticism is to fortify the wall of self-control with, with that strong and impregnable uh, mortar of godly contentment. And as Paul concludes this section, to be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for yourselves a good foundation against the time to come that you may lay hold on eternal life. Amen. Let us stand in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, glory be to thy name. Thou art all sufficient, the everlasting God who has no needs and owns and possesses all. And thou hast, O Lord, given to us the greatest possession, namely thyself. Unbelievable as it may be, to we who are sinners, O Lord, thou hast given thyself. Thou hast given thine only begotten Son, O Lord, to suffer and to die, that we might be made the heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And yet, O God, we sinfully go about complaining, criticizing thee, coveting, and wanting more and more of this world. Lord, crucify these things in our lives. And Lord, we may live to thy glory, whether we're rich or whether we're poor, whether we're successful business owners or whether, oh Lord, we work for others. Our desire is to be content To realize our sufficiency comes not from what we have. Our sufficiency comes from thee, our God. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I invite you to turn with me in your Psalters to Psalm 41. And we'll be singing verses 5 through 10. <clears throat> the psalmist here presents the case for how his enemies have unjustly spoken and, and whispered uh, behind his back about him and against him. Even, he says, him, even him who was his familiar friend has betrayed him, pointing ultimately to the betrayal of the Lord Jesus Christ, which he was willing to endure Betrayal is one of the most difficult things that any of us can possibly go through. Jesus was willing to endure betrayal in order to rescue us, that we might never be betrayed by him. We'll be singing to the tune of martyrdom. Dun, 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 dun. <clears throat> Those that to me are enemies. Those that to me are enemies. Of me do evil say. Of me do evil say. When shall he die that so his name? When shall he die, that so his name may perish quite away? 
may perish fly away. To see me if he comes, he speaks. To see me if he comes, he speaks. Vain words, but then his heart. Vain words, but then his heart keeps mischief to it, which he tells. Keeps mischief to it, which he tells. When forth he doth depart. When forth he doth depart. My haters jointly whispering. My haters jointly whispering. Against me my hurt devise. Against me my hurt Devise mischief, say they, cleaves fast to him. Mischief, say they, cleaves fast to him. He lieth and shall not rise. He lieth and shall not rise. Yea, even mine own familiar friend. Yea, mine own familiar friend. On whom I did rely. On whom I did rely. Who ate my bread, even he his heel. Who ate my bread, even he his hill against me lifted high, against me he lifted high. But Lord, be merciful to me. But Lord, be merciful to me, and up again me raise, and up again me raise, that I may justly them requite, that I may just leave them requite according to their ways according to their ways let us stand and receive the benediction of the lord our god as is taken from psalm 84 verse 11 for the lord god is a sun and shield the Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Amen. You are dismissed.